Next on C-SPAN, it's a review of this past weekend's U.S.-Russia summit and other events in the news. Our guests for the next 90 minutes are syndicated columnist Ken Adelman and Christopher Hitchens, a columnist for Vanity Fair. Over the past few days, the nation and the world had a chance to see President Clinton in two leadership roles. First, the Forest Conference in the western part of the United States, and then the Vancouver Summit. How did he do? I think he does very well at these kind of uh, issues and on these kind of sessions because he's quite personable. He's interested in substance. And uh, by and large, he likes to have people get around and discuss it and work it out together. I think that plays into his strength. Chris Hitchin, same, same question to you. We know each other so well, you can call me Christopher now. All right, I, I will. Um, <laughs> very strong and very marked contrast between the two, uh, I thought. In the case of the um, Timber versus Owl conference, the president favors both Timber and Owls and managed to at least give the impression of splitting the difference. And that's a particular skill of his, I think, is being on all sides of every question and all things to all men. In the Vancouver case, it's extraordinary to me the extent to which he has absolutely made up his mind. What Boris wants, Boris gets. Boris is our man. Everything for Yeltsin. I think it's myself a very dangerous and um, misguided policy, but one can't criticize it on the um, normal grounds that one criticizes President Clinton, that it's wobbly or waffly. It's, it's very, very loud and clear and direct. Okay, but having said that, let me add that um, there's not that much controversy within the United States on that. There are not that many people say distance themselves from uh, Yeltsin. So in essence, not Clinton this morning, no. But yeah, um, but in essence, Clinton is not taking a uh, profile and courage on that. Plus, secondly, let me say, Christopher, that um, when he says whatever Boris wants, Boris gets. Boris isn't getting all that much. I mean, the point of the summit was that Clinton said all the assistance I'm announcing today has been passed by Congress and is ready to go. Well. Price. If it's passed by Congress and ready to go, that means he has an add much. There's a bit of a, a, a sleight of hand there because I mean, no. they, it was more, more than double, or nearly double rather, um, what had been announced in advance. Uh, was one billion had been proposed, and it was it's 1.8 billion when you factor everything in. Well, Second, as a matter of fact, um, I don't generally think opinion polls tell you very much about what people are thinking, and this may apply in this case. But insofar as they do give a reading on this. It seems to me the public is quite skeptical about the Yeltsin um, program and the, and the aid package to Russia. They think money, is, money probably isn't going where it's meant to, and I think their instinct on that is probably sound. Mm -hmm. Let me just and they probably don't like the look of, of Mr. Yeltsin, which um, um, I think would also be a sound instinct. Let me get let you get back to this in a second, but let me jump in and tell our audience who you are and what we're doing this morning. Uh, we have 90 <laughs> minutes, as we do each Monday morning, for a discussion at our table here. Uh, we have two special guests who, if you watch C-SPAN regularly, you will recognize their faces. Christopher Hitchens is with us this morning. He is a columnist whose work appears regularly in both Vanity Fair and The Nation. Kenneth Edelman is also with us this morning, whose syndicated column appears in how many newspapers? Now? Well, I'd like more, but about 25. We have a half an hour for a discussion, and then at that point we will be joined by your telephone calls from around the country. During our first half hour, our C-SPAN telephone number will be on the screen, so you can dial in with your comments or your questions for our two guests. Let me go back to the discussion on the summit, but you're using a figure that was so widely reported yesterday at $1.6 Washington Times this morning reports $3.6 billion. A lot of that depends on how much you include that's in the pipeline already. I mean, you know... You always have money that has been, A, proposed to Congress and not passed by Congress. Then you have money that is proposed to Congress and has been passed by Congress. And now you have money that you're going to propose to Congress and hasn't been. So it depends on how you package the whole thing. For Clinton to make a big deal out of saying that a lot of this assistance has already been passed by Congress and is ready to go is to say that it's already on on the way, so it's no big contribution yeah. of Bill Clinton. Plus, let me add that it sounds wonderful to say that you are all for food aid, for example. People think, oh my gosh, you know, you have to eat, and it's just great. The question is, how much is this kind of aid needed? I have uh, looked into the situation of food aid in Russia, and the fact is that the uh, caloric intake is very high. 
that uh, what pockets, in very small pockets, there are where they need food is a distribution problem that's not going to help by any, having any more food in the system. It's going to help by having trucks to go to these places. But by and large, it's, it's almost impossible to find any kind of food deficiency in, the, in Russia right now. So that kind of thing helps American farmers, and that's great. But it helps American farmers to take, you know, buy the grain and just shove it in the ocean. Let me have you clarify what aspect of Mr. Clinton's policy you thought was misguided. Well, I, I've been distressed for some time the extent to which um, Boris Yeltsin seems to have a veto on certain kinds of American policy. For example, in the case of Bosnia, which we might have to treat under a separate heading. But it's evident to me that one of the excuses given by the administration for um, watching and permitting the physical destruction of the Muslim population of former Yugoslavia is that um, Russian public opinion is, generally speaking, pro-Serb. Uh, and the parliament, the comprises Mr. Yeltsin's enemies is strongly pro-Serb on grounds of Slavic and Christian Orthodox solidarity. So that uh, we say, the State Department, the Defense Department say, let's not make Boris's life any harder with his parliament by doing anything dramatic to help the Bosnians, which means in effect that you're giving the Russian parliament, Mr. Yeltsin's enemies, a veto over US policy in Bosnia, which amounts, as I say, to the passive um, witnessing of genocide. So I think that's, I've been depressed by that for a long time. Then I'm, I'm bored with hearing that Mr. Yeltsin is the only elected leader in the, in the former Soviet Union. That's not true. I mean, for one thing, his, his vice president, Alexander Rutskoy, is also elected. And he happened to point out the other day that um, $59 million of dollars of the aid so far given has, to his certain knowledge, been stolen by the perestroika mafias who now dominate the exchange and distribution in, in Moscow and its environs. He called it a crime, which I think was an understatement. There's no assurance that I've heard from anybody that, that won't happen to the, to the forthcoming uh, tranches. And then third, I thought, I thought it was simply flat out disgraceful for an incoming democratic administration to make as its first major foreign policy statement the, the commitment in advance that if Mr. Yeltsin was to scrap the Constitution, close the Parliament, and rule by uh, direct fiat, the, the United States wouldn't oppose it if he did do it. He then did do it, and then he took it back, neither move inspiring much confidence. And still, it's everything for Boris, whose caloric intake, uh, to borrow a phrase from Mr. Edelman, is apparently very high indeed. Let's show a clip from the Vancouver summit. We'll come back with Ken Edelman's comments on Mr. Yeltsin and the politics of personality. We are investing today not only in the future of Russia, but in the future of America as well. Mr. President, our nation will not stand on the sidelines when it comes to democracy and Russia. We know where we stand. We are with Russian democracy. We are with Russian reforms. We are with Russian markets. We support freedom of conscience and speech and religion. We support respect for ethnic minorities. We actively support reform and reformers and you in Russia. The ultimate responsibility for the success of Russia's new course, of course, rest with the people of Russia. It is they who must support economic reforms and make them work. But Americans know that our nation has a part to play, too, and we will do so. Kenneth Edelman, you wrote a column uh, a, a short time back where you say that, it, that personalities matter in politics. And here are two politicians that have, as you know, put an emphasis on personality. How does it figure into the relations between our two nations? Well, I think it's important to realize that uh, individuals make history and that who is in charge of Russia today makes an enormous amount of difference, whether it is Yeltsin or his vice president or somebody from left field. And so I think that you have to factor that in and to realize that your choices are not against Thomas Jefferson and Boris Yeltsin, but about uh, Boris Yeltsin versus the field. I really do think, though, that when you think about, um, as Christopher was saying, when you think about development in Russia, it's uh, daunting and um, very discouraging. And I say that because, if I may, here's how I think about the problem. It is that what makes prosperity in Russia is the same thing that has made prosperity throughout history. There's no great trick in knowing what succeeds for a country. And it's the same thing that succeeded for the British in the 18th century. And there are four elements. Number one is a legal system that's relatively clear that guarantees private property and the sanctity of the contract. 
Number two is real money, some currency of real value that people can buy things with. Number three is relatively low taxes that gives incentive to people to work and keeps the government relatively small. And number four is an absence of corruption, overall absence of corruption. Now, when you take those four criteria and apply it to today's Russia, you realize you're 0 for 4. You're not even close on any of the four. Plus, when you think to yourself, if I may take one more second, when you think to yourself, what case study is the best example we have? Well, East Germany. East Germany in October 31st, October 30th, 1990, all of a sudden got all four things overnight. Why? Because they became part of Germany. Okay, they got a stable currency, they got relatively low taxes, they got a relatively honest governmental system, and they got a legal system that's clear and private property and sanctity of the contract. All right, with all four things, this little entity of 16 million people has received $100 billion from the German government year after year and is going to receive $100 billion from the German government to the end of the century just to get it even with uh, West Germany, the other German. Okay, if you take that, you realize that you're talking about one-tenth the size of Russia today. You're talking about a place that has gotten all four necessary but not sufficient uh, things, elements for prosperity. You're talking about a place that only had communism for 40 years and not 75 years. Plus, you're talking about Germans who are naturally hardworking and not Russians, who, you know, it's still questionable. When you look at that analysis and compare the situation in East Germany um, and what it's gone through to the situation in Russia, you realize that what you're talking about, 1.2, 1.3 billion dollars, 400 million, whatever it is, and what the IMF does, it really is lost in the noise. Given that analysis, <laughs> what's the West to do? Well, actually, I'm very glad Kennedyman mentioned Germany because I was wanting to bring it up myself um, at a slightly different angle. Um, it's true that when you compare the, the real problems of Russia to either the Washington Times' figure or the New York Times' figure this morning, 1.7 or 3.5 billion, drop in the bucket either way, it's, Im it's domestically important to a president who's broken his promise not to raise taxes on the middle class and is issuing various inspiring therapeutic calls for belt tightening um, all around the place. Um, the truth is, he, if his policy is going to work, he's going to have to use other people's money to pay for it, and it will, in fact, be Deutschmarks. Uh, I believe I'm correct in saying that 60% 60, 60 of the Russian debt, which is a, around $80 billion, is held by Germany. And so they're going to have to be persuaded to take the same lenient and credulous line on Mr. Yeltsin's survival as the president does, and they have to put their Deutschmarks behind that kind of policy. Now, I think we have just as much of an interest in the solvency and stability of Germany, if not more of an interest in the solvency and stability of Germany, as we do in the survival of, um, of the Yeltsin regime. And I think, therefore, people ought to have a livelier idea of quite how much is in the scale here. I've already mentioned the physical survival of the Bosnians. Now we have the, the possible political and, and economic stability of the, of the Federal Republic of Germany. Um, th these are quite big chips to be gambling, and I don't think in the, in the general debate in Washington any attempt has been made to educate the public into what's at stake. You mentioned domestic policy. It's 15 minutes past the hour, and I want to move into that uh, for the second half of our Let discussion. Me pick up just okay. one other comment. When, when <clears throat> as um, Clinton does, as Bush did, as uh, all presidents do, when they talk about you know the Western assistance and the G7 mm. and all this, and as Christopher says, other people's money. When you're talking about other people's money, you're talking about two entities. You're talking about Germany and you're talking about Japan, okay? Germany with $100 billion into East Germany does not have a lot of enormous mon money left over for Russia. No. And you have the questions of stability that uh, Christopher raised. And uh, the J Japanese government is no fat stuff these days. I mean, they have uh, their economy has shrunk by 40% over the last year. And so that is a big blow. And uh, whether they have the money to do this is very, very doubtful. If you watched the weekend talk programs uh, over the weekend, there was a theme that you heard on many of them, and that is whether or not President Clinton is, in fact, tackling too much too soon. That's uh, something echoed by a column that was in the Washington Post on Sunday by Elizabeth Drew. Uh, is there a problem with the president tackling too much, and what's the definition of too much, I guess I should add? It takes a lot to make me cry, but I, I realized that Elizabeth Drew in that piece was trying to bring tears to my eyes. She was talking about 
these lovely young men who work for the Clinton, the terrible hours, they get up at 7.30, they go to bed at 11, you know, should they be working this hard for us? Do we deserve these sacrifices? Yeah, yeah I think it's ridiculous. I mean, they're, they're hungry, greedy, ambitious people. They work very, very hard. And they, want to be, they like being in power. Um, I don't think they're overworking um, on the issues at all, no. I mean, they seem to take things just about one at a time. The problem is that unless it's everything for Boris, you're never quite sure what their policy is. Um, I mean, I, for example, um, would rather see people being demobilized from the armed services than mustered into them. And indeed, that's all on hold for Mr. Yeltsin, too, at the moment. But I think that um, if you're going to be mustering people in, it shouldn't matter if they're homosexual, for example. And anyway, it was a campaign promise. And anyway, it's a matter of principle. Now, how could you tell that it was either of those things in the way it's been handled? More important, I think, is, the, is that Mr. Clinton seems unaware of the tradition of civilian control of the military and that the, uh, the title of Commander-in-Chief isn't a decorative one. I mean, he allows himself to be humiliated in public by unelected military men. There was a, I don't, did you see Barton Gelman's piece in the Washington Post the other day? Absolutely shameful piece. Um, uh, well, great piece of describing a shameful incident. Uh, the President and the Secretary of State for Defense, Les Aspen, went to the deck of the USS the Roosevelt aircraft carrier and they were, they were openly mocked by the officers and crew, lampooned and guide around the deck, and didn't protest about it, just wore these terrible smarmy grins as if to say, excuse us for being, for being elected. And as the reporter pointed out, you didn't get that with Reagan and Bush. Now, this is Banana Republic stuff. So it seems to me that um, the, <coughs> the uh, problem is not at all as Elizabeth Drew identifies, that they're, they're, all, they're trying to do too much, it's that they are trying to dodge what are the real responsibilities of being being in power? One of the consequences of her thesis, as she put it, doing too much, is that throwing too many large issues at Congress will mean that even a Congress that wants to be supportive will eventually rebel. Would you comment on that? Yeah, let me comment first on what Christopher says. First of all, it's just not true that there's uh, no decommissioning. Uh, individuals are leaving the armed services in droves right now. Uh, the armed services is going down from 2.1 So can I just clarify that, million, if you don't mind? Yeah. I didn't mean there was no decommissioning going on. I did what I meant by the Yeltsin analogy, though, was that at his speech at Annapolis last week, the president did say that the future of the downsizing, of, I hate the word, but, you know, the reduction of the vast military establishment would depend on what happened to Mr. Yeltsin, as if uh, Russia could come back as the Soviet Union if Mr. Yeltsin fell, which I, do, I don't believe and I doubt that you do. No, I, I don't... I agree with you on that. Uh, the point is, though, the numbers are leaving the armed services like mad right now. Second point on the um, respect in the military, I think that there is a function of the military to give its views in terms of gays in the military and issues like that. Um, it has surprised me that Bill Clinton is so uh, tuned to different groups and their sensitivities, but he hasn't been attuned at all to the sensitivity of the military. Uh, individuals who have uh, devoted their lives given to them protecting. Les Aspen, who's given them Les Aspen is the best friend they've ever had. Okay, let me finish. That's pretty sensitive. Let me finish. And uh, people who have given their lives to protecting this country and uh, who have really served awfully well and are serving awfully well today. Rather than understanding <coughs> his the baggage he brings as Commander-in-Chief, that he basically dodged the draft, that he basically had uh, said negative things about the military. With all that, I would have expected Bill Clinton to enter office and to make a big effort to go and realize that he connects with them, that they serve very well, to have briefings with them, to, you know, to do it that I care, basically. Instead, he hit the office, he started out with gays in the military, which is a whole other subject, but it's not one that they take a, a great shine to, mm -hmm. uh, let me say. And uh, he didn't really bring out the glories of the military, he just made it another institution for social engineering in the United States. Plus, he slashed way beyond anything he promised during the campaign. I think the defense cuts are twice what he said he would do during the campaign. And he was very careful about saying that we only had to trim 5% of what the Bush requests were and, you know, it was no big deal between him. Well, it turned out to be an enormous big deal on the cuts. I think he handled the military extremely badly. Now, on to your question, Sue, Susan. 
Um, I think hard work is uh, very nice. I think it's a necessary uh, ingredient to a successful government, but I don't think it's very sufficient. We've had enormously hardworking individuals like uh, Jimmy Carter, who I think were pretty poor presidents. We've had enormously unhardworking presidents like Ronald Reagan, who I think was a very successful president. I remember somebody went to Ronald Reagan one time and said, you know, Mr. President, we see that you take naps and are, uh, kind of have it uh, very easy. You know, hard work never killed anybody. And Reagan looked at him and says, I know, but why take a chance? What you really want in a administration is that when the issues are, A, the issues are framed well, and when it's leadership is absolutely needed when there's nobody else around to decide anything or take leadership the president steps out and makes the right decision at those times and in my mind we elect the president for you know maybe three or four times a year to step up and say this is the thing to do we move on to congress mm -hmm. uh, what is happening with the gop senators and their, their uh, filibuster on the economic stimulus plan. How do you read that whole scenario? I find it very hard to read. I mean, I think it's, it looks to me as if it might just be, you know, uh, an exercise to keep the troops out in the sticks, aware of the fact that the GOP is still there. It doesn't have the look to me of a real visceral, jugular type of a fight. Um, and I was most interested to see a column uh, a couple of weeks ago now by, by Evans and Novak, um, about the, the apparent conversion undergone by Jack Kemp to social democracy and the terrific, um, did you happen to notice it? Mm -hmm. The terrific d dismay this was spreading in the Republican ranks because there were so many people thinking that Kemp would be their standard bearer next time and, and on a whole range of subjects he appeared to be moving towards a sort of liberal or centrist uh, position. I think, I think they really don't know what they're doing, they just feel they've got to do something, go through the motions. Kenneth Edelman, let me read you what Adam Clymer says about the GOP in the Senate uh, this morning in the New York Times. He says that the fight is about Republican power collectively and also individually. He goes on to say that the Clinton administration was surprised by the ferocity and persistence of the Republican attack. It tends to dismiss Republican motives as petty. That seems to be part of it, but it doesn't explain the unified Republican front. Joining in the filibuster, after all, are senators who dislike Mr. Graham and his comrades in confrontation, like Trent Lott, Larry Craig, and on and on. Well, I think, I think Christopher is right in the sense that this is something to do. And so far, that they have not really been able to find their backside with both hands uh, since Clinton has come <coughs> in office. And secondly, I think that they have a very good point. And the point is that Bill Clinton said, if you want to have cuts, show me where, and I'll think seriously about it. Well, that was very nice to introduce his economic package, but it wasn't sincere in any sense, because they rolled in and said, okay, we'll show you cuts. Stop the stimulus package it is the easiest place not to have cuts. We don't need additional spending of the magnitude that he has proposed. And I think they're absolutely right. I think that, um, for example, uh, and I'll take the most controversial one, Head Start. Everybody puts up Head Start as the icon of what an <laughs> ideal government program would look like. Everybody who loves government must love Head Start. Everybody who loves kids must love Head Start. But every study I have seen since working in the poverty program in the end of the 60s and early 70s, the Office of Economic Opportunity, shows that in second grade, third grade, fourth grade, by that time, any kid in Head Start is indistinguishable from another kid who did not partake in Head Start. All right? The advantages are washed out by third or fourth grade. If that is true, and if every report over the last 20 years has shown that, that I have seen, but if that is true, then what are we talking about? We're not giving a head start. What we're doing is giving a head start for first and second grade, maybe. And it's well, washed it school, out by well, third grade. If it was called a catch-up program, then it would be considered a howling success, surely. I mean, all you're saying is it doesn't keep people in front all the time, but a head start... All the time. It doesn't yeah. keep well, if people it, in front by the I was third actually grade. Rather, I was rather impressed by the finding you just gave. Maybe, maybe I wasn't listening. Damn, okay, here's the pretty point. Good to me. Here's the point, Christopher. You have a group of kids. You spend an enormous amount of money on one group to give them a head start. Those advantages are gone by third grade. But you don't factor in what would have happened to them if the money hadn't been spent. Well, sure, Where because you have be your that? control group. You have a control group of kids who have not gone through Head Start. And they're the same by third grade. There's no intellectual advantage of the kids who are in Head Start. 
Okay? So, so you have a perfect control group. Is this group. the first cut you would make? I would say I would not triple it or whatever Clinton is doing. I certainly would want to show if there is any success in Head Start. Maybe there's a way to do it, spending more on each kid. <clears throat> maybe there's extending the day. Maybe there's, you know, maybe there are individual Head Start programs that show a lasting impact, at least lasting through grammar school, right. you know, not through third grade. And I certainly would not jack up the program, what is it, four times, five times what it was, and they can't handle money. I have never seen a government program handle money that's jacked up twice, three times, four times. That's one. Number two is the whole idea on, um, you know, just summer programs, another very, very popular thing. And I'll take the, Susan, I'll take the two most popular. <coughs> well, I mean, you know, keep the kids off the streets, they're out of school and everything like that. I think summer programs for kids, unless they're very specified that they really have to work and do something, t tells kids basically that they get into the jobs, into career patterns, into the workforce, and all they have to do is show up, and they don't really have any real work to do. I think it's a terrible lesson. And what I have seen in the uh, government there's Marion programs... Pro there's Marion Barry programs that were such a failure in, in Washington. What are those? Well, they're usually given to him to friends of his to operate, but okay. um, they were sort of esteem-building alleged you know, summer camps. They don't appear to have worked out at all well. Okay, it's one thing to give them to your friends, which is bad. It's another thing to say, okay, here's your paycheck, and why don't you hang around the street corner, and you are in a job. That's a terrible thing for a kid to learn that that's the way the real, real world works once you get a job. On the uh, Clinton economic package, so I want to show you the Wall Street Journal from this morning. <coughs> it seems lately to printing lists. A couple of uh, weeks ago, they had the full list of the people who served on the health care task force. This morning, the list is of the kinds of projects that uh, appear in the $16.3 billion, $16.2 billion stimulus package. Uh, and uh, you can see some of the things are of constructing a new gym in Auburn, Alabama, renovated theater in Phoenix, Arizona, on down the list. It says how many jobs are expected to be created and how much money will be spent on each particular project. What do you think of this stimulus package? Well, I think it's for show, like very largely for show. Should it be passed? No. Are you a Republican, Christopher? No. Mm -hmm. No, I'm a socialist. But I mean, I'm, uh, I'm very, I'm, in, I'm incredibly unimpressed by this sort of um, strength through joy uh, policy of the, the Clintons. Sort of everyone, everyone's on the team, everyone's got to keep applauding, everyone's got to keep clapping. Um, and everyone's supposed to do what's very loosely defined as, as um, national service. Uh, it's, it smacks of corporate state to me, and also of the wrong sorts of Keynesianism, i.e. the sort of thing that Lord Keynes himself described as burying banknotes in bottles and paying people to dig them up. I mean, so I said it's better than unemployment, but only a bit. Mr. Edelman, what do you think of the stimulus package? Well, I, I think your list is uh, astounding here. You have, um, you know, helping a sports and recreation building in Elmire, New York, building a swimming pool in White Plains, New York, a movie theater in Columbus, Ohio. Now, a movie theater in Columbus, <coughs> Ohio, $2.7 million, okay? I'm all for Columbus, Ohio people getting to see movies. Why does the U.S. government, why do my tax money have to go to a movie theater in Columbus, Ohio? And I have decided <coughs> one of my innovations I wrote in the column is that we should get away from the dollar amount. You know, I think the dollar is a poor standard for government spending because no one realizes that it's real money out there. And what I want to do is to change the dollar amount to a TP amount. Now, a TP is the average amount any taxpayer gives for federal taxes that year, which is about $4,000 or $4,500. All right? Now, when you do that, you realize that you're going to have situations where Robert Byrd, the Senate uh, Appropriations Leader, <coughs> has um, given millions of dollars for a new clock that's going to be a national clock that's going to be located in West Virginia. And I figured out it's something like 1,200 TPs will go for the, his clock in West Virginia, his home state. We already have two national clocks. There's going to be a third national clock, all right? I would like to see a situation where we get 1,200 New York taxi cab drivers into a room and have Robert Byrd address them and say, listen, 
everybody. All of your federal taxes for all of 1992, 100% of your federal taxes were going to go to play, pay for my clock, and let me explain the value of this to you. All right? Now, I would like to see a TP go and a construction worker from San Diego go to tell him why all of his money. Contribution, yeah. More than 10 TPs. Get 10 construction workers from San Diego and say, listen, all of your tax money, entirely, all of it, from 1992 is going to build a theater in Columbus, Ohio. Now, how do you feel about that, fellas? And my feeling is that the fellows aren't going to be real happy with that. Our clock says it's 30 minutes past the hour. It's time for us to invite our audience to join in. Let me uh, pause for a second and give those of you uh, who haven't seen our phone numbers, uh, give them to you so you can dial in if you have a question. If you live in the eastern or central time zone, our number here is 202-628-2525. If you're watching us in the mountain or Pacific time zones, our number is 202-783-2727. And we'll remind all of our regular viewers about C-SPAN's 30-day policy and ask you not to call in this morning if you've called us within the past month. First is Tampa, Florida. You're on the air. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah, you guys were uh, speaking earlier. Uh, I have two questions, by the way, but um, uh, the first one pertaining to uh, the way uh, school is taught. I, I mean, I'm 25 years old, and I've uh, dabbled in college and graduated from a technical institute, and uh, looking back after uh, these experiences, I realized that uh, the way uh, they teach is just ridiculous. They should have it uh, geared toward an applied uh, learning, uh, like take a lamp and get the math from that and the chemistry from that and everything, and uh, kind of a hands-on thing. Uh, otherwise, uh, most of the kids, uh, it's just a bunch of numbers and everything, kind of like uh, the monetary system that exists today. Ha ha. But um, I was uh, also wondering about investigative reporting. Uh, I noticed that, uh, you know, we had one uh, guy uh, lose his life uh, investigating the intel on the BCCI, and I was wondering um, if you guys have had any experience with uh, investigative reporting on the lines of uh, international banking and its connection to our uh, world manipulative trends Thank today. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Tampa, Florida. Christopher Hitchens. Well, I have children in American schools, but I don't. I didn't go through the process myself, so I always feel I should be both excused from and you know, exempt, generally exempt from questions about how the classroom actually works. Um, not much though I'd like to pronounce on it. My, my general impression is that, though, because I go and talk in colleges and so on quite a lot, is that um, uh, people are fantastically easily pleased uh, here. Um, that there's a, a great deal of too much emphasis on making students feel good about themselves and not enough realization that education is a process of uh, suffering as I was taught it in England and pain and, um, and bullying and misery so you really never forget the lessons that you're taught. I'd like to see sort of more cruelty in the American education system. In other words. Do you have any comments on the investigative? On the investigative um, I mean, so certain subjects, as George Orwell says, simply cannot be taught without corporal punishment. He specified Latin there, but I think there are probably some others too. Calculus would be one. Um, yes, I do, um, and I also know some good journalists who have paid a very high price in one or two cases, actually have risked and had, had lost their lives in, in trying to uh, bring us the bad news. Um, on the nexus that, that we think probably connects somewhere, uh, the BCCI scandal, the savings and loans scandal and the Iraq gate scandal and which I think if properly investigated would turn out also to be connected to the Iran Contra network. I don't believe in um, conspiracy theory, a phrase you used earlier on, but I don't believe completely in coincidence theory either. I'm very sad to see that, that this has dropped out of the headlines and that for example the excellent work done by Con Congressman Henry Gonzalez of Texas on the banking committee is apparently now no longer considered a high priority by the administration. I'm also appalled that there is not more of a scandal about the burning of archives and records and the destruction of, of files by the outgoing Bush administration. I think there should already be a special prosecutor about that. Mr. Edelman, either of those two topics, if you'd like. Yes, I think we have too many special prosecutors that are unguided and um, tenured in life with their staff, tenured in life. And I think it's a corrupt 
corrupting of the American government. Secondly, on education... You think Lawrence Walsh was the corrupt element in the, oh, in the Bush administration? Absolutely. No, I That's think a fantastic I, allegation. I think, I, think, I think it's extremely corrupt. Yes, I do. And I, it's not a fantastic allegation So you look at the whole record of that administration and you say the corrupt bit is the special prosecutor? No, that's not what I said. I mean, said. not even Ed Meese would say Listen, that. you should criticize me for what I said, well, not for what that I did say. That is what said. you seem to I say. I said that the way Walsh had that investigation, the way he has spent $35 million on it, the way he has gone on for six years without a conviction in court, is it absolutely scandalous. It's wrong on all it counts. It is just terrible. Wrong, that's wrong on all counts. The no, it is not. There were convictions. They were overturned by they Bush. They were overturned. Scandalous, okay, they were scandalous overturned. Christmas bombing of the Constitution by the outgoing president. Second, um, I don't know what you're talking about. Christmas it, bombing. Bush's Christmas pardons of the of the. Well, that's not a bombing, Christmas. I call it a Christmas bombing. Well, you can um, call an apple a uh, glass well, that's of water, okay. that's but what it's I'm not. Right? It's not a bombing. The second is, that it's not, it's is not Lawrence else. Walsh's fault that it take, that the investigation takes a long time, costs a lot of money. Everybody knows that evidence was deliberately destroyed and withheld, and so therefore the investigation but was, always, was needlessly protracted by, by a government that refused to honor its promise to cooperate with the investigation. Okay, so he hasn't gotten one conviction, as you said. Not, well, it, that hasn't been overturned by a corrupt outgoing, by corrupt outgoing president who was himself no, 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 going to be a target for the investigation. By the court. They were they were overturned. Uh, the, uh, in the, court. Uh, the, the, the relentless destruction and withholding of evidence. Which I, don't, I don't know charted. that. You don't know that. I don't know that. So I don't, I've never so, seen so any evidence. In fact, evidence. you do stick to your view that the only corrupt aspect of the thing was in the special no, prosecutor's no, no. office. No, no, no. I certainly didn't say it's that. The only time you used the word corruption about the whole. Yes, thing. I think that Walsh's um, investigation was very corrupt. I I don't know of any evidence that was uh, destroyed. Do you know of evidence that was destroyed? Mm. Tell yes, me. Among other things, it's in it's in well for a start. I mean, from the very beginning of the uh, Justice Department's invigilation of the, of the North Network, of the huge shredding parties were allowed. And we know that... Oh, that was we, incompetent. We know, I agree with you. That was terribly well, incompetent but when they were the investigating. Way down the road. And the, and the, um, that wasn't corruption. That was uh, incompetence. Pres the president himself said about his diaries, wh well, when asked why didn't you produce them when you promised that you were going to produce everything, he said, well, they never specifically asked me for that. Well, now this is... This is if that's not obstruction of justice, that's, that's it's a very not, good delay. That's not destroying of documents by your own definition. I said, he destroying, gave I said destroying and withholding. Evidence, Those are the two most salient examples. Withholding of evidence. He gave the diaries entirely. Finally. To, yeah. So that's yeah, not once, once it was discovered that he'd withheld them, but if what, what had been in most of those documents had been known about at the time when Reagan was still president, there would have been a good chance of impeaching him in a timely manner. Oh, as, I don't as believe that at all. I think what the uh, diaries show I mean, is, uh, number one, there was no evidence withheld or destroyed. Number two, that I know of. There may have been, but I don't know of any, and because by the, as you say, he gave up the uh, diaries. And, uh, and the, number two is, I don't think that Four they prove. I don't think that they prove any involvement by uh, Ronald Reagan beyond what we know. All right, let me jump in. Move on to a call from Kansas City, Missouri. You're on the air, caller. Okay. Well, finally, uh, I was listening intently to this morning's discussion, and I was absolutely appalled at Mr. Adelman's. Uh, implication that somehow only heterosexual people have uh, given their lives for this country. Um, I, I'd be willing to bet you that there are the names of a whole lot of gay people on that black granite wall up there in Washington, and uh, the same thing out there in uh, the Arlington Cemetery. Thank you, sir. Mr. Edelman? I agree with him. Riverside, California, you're on the air. Yes. It's, I'm a first-time caller. Glad to have you. And the, I want to say that CNN and company sent a reporter to check out on that list that was supposed to be in the stimulus plan. It is not in the stimulus plan. It is, it is a long list of wish book from a, all the mayors in the country, and they them to this group and ask them for the worst things in the whole list, but it is not in the stimulus plan. All right, thanks for the call. Let me read to you what the Wall Street Journal says. You, it says exactly what you said, which is from the Conference of Mayors Ready to Go book of 4,000 public works projects. It goes on to say that uh, while the Ready to Go projects aren't specifically included, it is the list the administration will work from in dispensing the $2.5 billion earmarked for community development, according to uh, HUD Secretary Henry Cisneros. So that's the reporting on it, according to the Wall Street Journal. Let me move on. Uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Go ahead, please. Hi there. Uh, thank you for C-SPAN. 
Why, I'm, I'm calling to address Mr. Hitchens there. Mr. Hitchens, you sound like you are not a citizen of this country. Are you a citizen of the United States? No, I'm not. You're not. Well, m Mr. Hitchens, I uh, don't like the way you are conducting your, uh, your uh, questions and your answers to us. I am... Um, Into each life some rain must fall, ma'am. I am very... Um, I'm a... Are you a socialist? Yes, I just said I was. Yes, well, um, I am a conservative. And uh, I am totally opposite where you're coming from. Yes, that's evident. And uh, I, uh, I, I, I just wish that you would think about what you're saying before you say it. Well, I promise to try. How's that? When you were addressing the, uh, the sailors on the ship, and you were emphatic about the way that they were mocking our president. Mm -hmm. I hope that you can really prove everything that you're trying to tell us. All right, yes, thank I, you. I, if you write to me, uh, care of this, I'll send you the I'll send you the proof of that by all means. Yeah. I don't think they're. Good this guarantee, by the, this guarantee, by the way, applies to um, all questions and all of my answers. So but I don't think you can guarantee. I don't think that there was uh, wide-scale mocking of uh, Bill Clinton when he went on the aircraft carrier Roosevelt at all. Well, I have more than one witness to it, but I thought I would I would direct I direct the lady uh, in question if she doesn't in case she doesn't want to write to me or anyone else who doesn't want to go to that trouble to look up Barton Gellman's report on the front page of the Washington Post. I can tell you the date. It was the date, it was the Saturday before the great blizzard that buried Washington. I can date it by that. Um, okay, but that, there was no, that's your evidence. It quoted the captain. It quoted several <coughs> officers and men by name, and they've made no effort to deny it. In saying that they were very uncomfortable with his leadership. No, no, no. If I held the commissions that those guys hold, um, and it, it had been reported of me that I'd taken this view about the elected commander-in-chief, I would want to be in a position to deny it, and they haven't tried to. Okay, but what do you mean by wide-scale mocking in... Uh, I don't... I didn't get well, that Well, I'll tell you exactly. I mean, in the, um, the captain appealed over the tannoy because um, marine snipers were holding marriage ceremonies on the deck and mincing up and down, and so as the helicopter was about to land, uh, people were stepping out of rank and... Um, and making obscene remarks about uh, the First Lady and uh, the President of the First Lady's daughter. Uh, the captain who's named appeals over the town and says, well, okay, maybe we didn't vote for him, but I think we ought to show respect and so on, in, with what was described as a pleading tone in his voice. This is disgraceful, okay? These guys live on uh, the, off public funds. The, there is a tradition of civilian control, which means that it doesn't matter whether you agree with the policy or not. The commander-in-chief is a civilian and will be obeyed. And that's always enjoyed, I think quite correctly, overwhelming public support, no matter whether people like the policy or not, ever since Truman dealt with MacArthur. What I thought was much, much worse than all of this was the reaction of Aspen and Clinton. They acted as if they should be excused for being elected. I, I think it was an absolutely devastating report. I, I okay, can't, I can't, let me address I can't this. give it enough currency, and I, I thought it was um, unusually good judgment of the, of the post, which I think is too often avoids controversy, to put it on the front page and feature it and say this kind of thing didn't used to happen under a Reagan and Bush. It's a clear politicized indiscipline in the armed forces. Well, well I would make the point, okay. Christopher, that uh, Reagan and Bush merited more respect from the military than well, Bill anyone, Clinton. Anyone you know, who, so let's, let's not start out that this. doesn't require a comment from me. Okay, then don't give a comment no, if you don't have a comment. Me. Number two is, so I think they merited more. I think they had more respect for the military. I think they had more appreciation with the military and what the military has done for this country and what the military is doing now for this country. And there's not the kind of uh, disparaging uh, attitude that Clinton has shown over the years. Reagan number two, the arms to Iran that, number that two. took American hostages, I suppose, yeah. is what you mean. It had nothing to do with the and arming military. And Bush for arming Saddam Hussein. These are the things that merit the respect, right? A, I don't believe it's true at all. You uh, don't. But are you going to let me finish or not? No, I'm going to. I'm going to keep okay. harassing you while you defend Reagan and Bush. Why not? Well, because I showed respect to you and let you finish your points. Okay, you give, I'll take. I don't know what you mean. Give and take. Okay, but let me finish then. Okay, come on, don't be so sorry for yourself. All right. I mean, my if you point. Can't stand a little heckly. We shouldn't be on discussion. All right, why don't you go on? All right, I'll take another call. Cocoa Beach, Florida. You're on the air. Good morning.
Yes, I haven't heard any discussions on the fact that uh, Lloyd Benson's son was forgiven $20 million by the Resolution Trust Corporation. Could I hear their views on this, please? All Thank right. you. Thanks very much. We'll start with Ken Mr. Adelman. Mr. Adelman, not interrupted. Sorry. Yes, I don't know anything about it. All right. Do you know anything about yes, this? Yes, I do. And I agree with the, with the questioner. Um, it seems to me extraordinary, the lenience of the reporting on it, especially given that, though it was also very belated, the press did finally catch up to Neil Bush's role in the savings and loan. I think he was very lucky not to go to jail. Um, the fact that, that Mr. Clinton's choice for Secretary of, of the Treasury should have a son in a not, un, no, not dissimilar position, having to repay a lot of bad debts to Resolution Trust Corporation taxes, should have been, should have been given a great deal more prominence than it was. We're halfway through because our... Because after all, if there's any, ever been any such thing as a bipartisan scandal, and therefore there should be even-handed treatment of the villains, and it shows what is really meant by gridlock, is bipartisan collusion on the Hill, it's the savings and loan question. Uh, we're halfway through our program with our two special guests. Dex Cheyenne, Wyoming, is on the air. Good morning. Hi. Uh, I've been enjoying the program this morning. It's been uh, quite a lot of give and take there. But one of the things that I've been concerned about... Uh, as I've been watching, uh, I guess I'm one of those C-SPAN junkies out here and really enjoying all of the opinions and, and abilities that you're giving us to uh, to see our government at, if you'll pardon the expression, work. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the thing that I've been uh, looking at is the reporting of all the mean old Republicans holding up this bill. It's not the mean old Republicans that are holding up the stimulus package. It's the few brave Democrats who are uh, kicking against uh, the uh, bulk of the uh, democratically controlled Congress because of the tremendous outpouring of public opinion uh, and letters that are being written and, and uh, uh, information that's being passed back and forth from the people who have finally gotten a hand on the government through uh, organizations like United We Stand America, uh, Common Cause, uh, the uh, uh, Concord Coalition and all of the other citizens groups who finally have gotten the uh, will and the opinion and the strength to start standing up against all this stuff. And, and uh, it, it's primarily because C-SPAN has been there and to, to kind of let us see what's happening. Uh, I've written several letters to Boren and the Committee on Organization of Congress, who I, I just think is a wonderful committee. Our government is starting to work, and uh, I just hope the stimulus package can be defeated. Thank you for the call. Kenneth Edelman, we'll start with I, you. I agree with him. I think that uh, you have to ask yourself that uh, the economy is doing relatively better now. There's a uh, Bush recovery going on. Um, secondly, that uh, a lot of this money would be wasted. I have been, was in the government for 12 years. I saw how the government spends money, and it makes me very uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable because a lot of the um, directions given from Washington, a lot of the projects given to Washington are either wasted projects or uh, misguided. And so other things being equal, I would say that um, this kind of money looking for good projects to fund from Washington should be just saved. And uh, plus the deficit, I was have come under the view that the deficit is something that is very serious and this have launched new and uh, big spending government programs right now I think is is dangerous. Christopher Hitchens, you, you commented earlier about the stimulus program. What do you think about the federal deficit? There are always debates about its import. What do I think about the federal deficit? Are you one of those who thinks it's, it's a concern for the economy overall or something that just should be managed? Well, I mean, there are there is a school that no, almost never gets ventilated that says a bit of debt is good for you and uh, it, it's better than inflation. Uh, but it seems to me, as, an, as a lay person in these matters, that, that the transformation of the country into a debtor nation that's gone on over the last decade and a bit does have sort of fantastically severe implications, such as the one I mentioned earlier about relying in effect on German credit and German solvency to run a foreign policy, uh, because it's no longer really possible for the United States to assume um, any further debt load. I mean, these these are things that that uh, that merit the, uh, the the worry that's expressed about them. No, no. But on the other hand, there you see, I'm always interested in what gets cut and what does what doesn't. For example, 
the Library of Congress, which I think is one of the great public and national resources, is increasingly cutting back its hours so that no one who works a real day job can really ever can use the library. Only people like myself who can go there during the day. Um, because at weekends and in the evenings it's increasingly being cut back. When you protest about this and say this is really vandalizing something that took generations to build up, people say, yeah, but what about the deficit? So I'm always suspicious about the uses of the deficit in political argument. Flint, Michigan, good morning. Good morning. I'd like to agree with Mr. Hitchens. And I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Adelman how many TPs it took taxpayer units or whatever to uh, do in El Mazzotti and how many TPs was it I agree with you I think everyone agrees with you that the government could be more frugal more efficient but from what I see in the papers we're spending a lot of those um, TPs to kill people in El Salvador to make sure that USAID which is a front company for the CIA to make cheap labor and now our companies are going there because they can guarantee cheap labor and in the meantime no one talks about and I'd like Mr. Hitchens to talk about that Mr. Casolo some more and what they were doing with our money in FEMA when there was um, some natural disasters going on they were they were, that was FEMA was the separate government that North and Casey were setting up and one final thing and I'll get off the air is we're sending those taxpayer units to Incata and Mangisotho Busalesi so they can burn tires on black people's necks. How many taxpayer units, Mr. Adelman, do you like, do you like those? Ones? Well, generally speaking, foreign aid is uh, <coughs> criticized by callers um, such as we've had here. And... Um, Yes, you can, you can waste a lot of money on foreign aid. I know of no money going to Encada, for example, to boot lazy so that uh, there can be neck lacing. And I do know that some job training programs in South Africa, for example. I think that um, jobs in El Salvador are basically a good thing. And what we can do is uh, stimuli, stimulate uh, economic development in El Salvador or anywhere. It rebounds to American credit, especially into uh, Latin America. But if you're asking me to defend the TPs going to foreign aid every year, uh, leave me out of it. I have not been a supporter of foreign aid for a very long time. Uh, I'm not sure everyone got the everyone listening got the reference to El Mazzotti that the, that the questioner included. Uh, that's a, a terrible massacre of civilians conducted by the armed forces of El Salvador um, in the early 1980s, which was. Um, known about uh, but lied about by the uh, United States government and by the U.S. Embassy in San Salvador and has since been discovered in the form of mass graves and so forth uh, to, have, to have both, both to have taken place and to have been covered up um, along with a very large number of other atrocities committed by soldiers who were under the direct arming training and payment of uh, American advisors. I, it, to me it isn't the, really the dollar value of that that matters anymore. I think was it was appalling to spend nearly half a billion a year on, on the El Salvador armed forces. But given that the war is now over, and given the relative size of the contending parties, it seems to me really terrible that there isn't uh, a, a proper war crimes inquiry uh, going on in the United States as to who was responsible and who knew and who covered up and who lied to Congress uh, about the certification of human rights progress in El Salvador for those years when, when high officials were in a position to know of kidnapping, torture, and murder of everyone from the Archbishop of San Salvador down. I think there should be a war crimes trial. Our next call is from Managua, Nicaragua. Uh, hello? Yes, sir, you're on the air. Mm -hmm. uh, congratulations to Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Hitchens on the audacity of his reporting. Uh, the mendacity by the Reagan-Bush administration proved to be very true. Uh, the pardon of uh, Cap Weinberger is in incredible to me. It only proves that Bush was up to his eyeballs in that same uh, uh, plan to uh, lie to the American people. Thank you. Sir, are you, uh, you never know, watching us by satellite dish, I presume, in Managua. Any comment there? No, I think he sounds like a good guy. We'll take our next call from New Jersey. Cameron Circle, New Jersey. You're on the air. Uh, good morning. Mr. Hitchens, you echo my words and my thoughts for years. I've been thinking about this, and finally someone has made the point. Isn't it true 
that if Oliver North had not been forgiven by the Congress by immunity during his testimony that he'd be cracking rocks and doing hard time even today. And that's, I just can't understand why the things that really convicted him were things that in some cases that caused immunity and therefore allowed him to go free at a later date through overturning certain things that were not admissible in court. Thank you. I think, um, I think Oliver North would certainly have been convicted if it were, and a lot of other people too, if the grants of immunity hadn't been made. And I think also the, the refusal of the uh, Senate and House inquiry to issue any subpoenas was, was uh, again, a reflection of the fact that from the very beginning they didn't wish to know. Uh, they didn't want a confrontation with the White House. They didn't want to know the truth, which would have led to a confrontation. Sure. Yeah, this is all old history now, but I'm glad that there are people out there who still remember it because, you see, it's always said of people like you that you don't really exist. The American people, we're told, don't care about that anymore. It's a non-subject and so forth. I don't believe this. I think people do care about the Constitution and do mind that it was so maltreated and do mind that the Congress that should have sprung to its defense declined to do so. Congress warned at the time that granting that kind of immunity would um, hurt a court case. And what they wanted to do is to have these great hearings uh, to show that they were really on top of the issue. The great hearings that were supposed to help Congress so much really backfired because they helped Dolly North so much mm -hmm. and in his defense. Um, I heard of the um, Iran-Contra episode, fiasco, on the way back from Reykjavik during the summit there with Gorbachev and Reagan in October of 1986. First time I heard of it, I thought it was um, just absolutely um, bizarre. I thought it was ridiculous. I thought it was misguided. And uh, I really haven't changed my mind <laughs> since then. I think that Ollie North did some terrible things both to the U.S. government, to the reputation of the Reagan administration, and um, I don't know if to the Constitution, but I do think that there is an integrity to government. And having, like I say, worked in the government for 12, 13, 14 years, I realized, looking back on it, that you just have to take people's word for it in the United States government. Credibility counts for an enormous amount, and that is the glue that holds the government together. If you start lying to the Congress, if you start lying to your fellow members in the administration, uh, everything kind of falls apart. You cannot proceed on that basis. And uh, to me, what Ali North and John Poindexter and others that I was associated with in the Reagan administration did was to break those bonds of trust, and um, they should be held responsible. I think their behavior is abominable. Oliver North is a candidate for U.S. Senate in Virginia. you have any comment on that? Yeah, I just think it's terrible. I think people should realize that here is somebody who's a pathological liar and who has uh, just served this country enormously. Uh, he was great in a uniform, trying to take a hill, and all the kind of skills you needed for taking a hill as a military uh, marine officer uh, are not those that work in the White House as a policy analyst. Santa Barbara, California. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my comments are for Mr. Edelman, although he vitiated what I wanted to say by <laughs> condemning North a bit. But, uh, you know, he threw out this $100 million figure that the uh, West Germans are putting into East Germany. $100 billion. I read that, and, you know, I'd like to know what's the breakdown. You know, that, that sounds phony, because are they putting $6 billion into roads and $10 billion into pensions? And then is the temerity to say <clears throat> the Germans are naturally hardworking. I lived in Germany from 1954 to 1957, and I can tell you the Germans li like to talk about hard they how hard they work, but they're not that hardworking. Thank the you. Italians work harder. Thank you, sir. All right, well, you never know that comparing the Italian economy to the German economy. <coughs> uh, I don't think anybody has ever said that the Italian economy <coughs> and the Italian workforce is the most productive in the world. My point was there is a hundred billion dollar figure that the Germans are pouring into uh, East Germany for, you know, a people of uh, 16 million, and they're going to do that for each year till the end of the century. What that goes for, I, it goes for roads, it goes for railroads, it goes for a new phone system, it goes for job training, it goes for all kinds of things to get them over 45 years of communism as opposed to Russia, which is 10 times the size of East Germany, uh, 70 years of communism. 
One of the traditions of our Monday morning program is to show you and our audience the uh, weekly news magazines and see what made the covers of them and get your comments on them. Actually, you're talking about East Germany, and in fact, it is an East German uh, who is on the cover. It says, the spy master un unmasked, the communist world's most successful espionage chief breaks his silence for the first time. And this is General Harry Schutt, former East German spy master. On Time Magazine's cover for April 12th, coming to your TV screen, the Info Highway, bringing a revolution in entertainment, news, and communication. And on Newsweek, loved to death, how the, how the fight to save endangered species can backfire. Christopher Hitchens, what do you think of what made the news weekly? I must say, um, I think that's a pretty poor load of covers. Um, East German spymaster unmasked is a headline I think the U.S. News and World Report keeps permanently in type. You know, they, they, whenever it's a slow week, that's what we see. How many features have we had on Marcus Wolf, who I thought was the great East German spymaster? Now apparently it's Harry Schutt. Um, so it has the ring of being bogus to me. Um, if you were... I, if you shouldn't, were I didn't come on television to compete against a panda. I mean, give me a chance. But I mean, you know, again, wildlife stories are a sign that not much is going on. What would you pick as a cover story if you were... For this week? Yes. That's an excellent question. Uh, what would I do? Um, hell, I would do Bosnia again, I'm sorry to say. Because it's, uh, this is the week that the Serbs have announced that within... By the end of the month, they intend to unify the areas of, of Bosnia and of Croatia that they've conquered with each other and with Serbia. In other words, for the first time since the Second World War in Europe, with the exception of the Turkish invasion of Cyprus, um, one country would have been allowed to completely remake the map by conquering the territory and expelling the population of others. I think that's great, a great story um, and should be better understood than it is. Ken Edelman, what do you think of what made the news weekly? I think that uh, the East German spy network and the spy master unmasked is a wonderful story. Uh, I haven't read this version, you just got it. But the fact is that it's uh, mind-boggling to think that the East Germans had something like 20% of their whole population cooperating with Stasi, uh, either as direct agents to spy on each other or reporting on each other. They would ask kids at school about what their parents said the night before. They would ask husbands about uh, wives. They would ask uh, sisters. But is this the kind I of mean, espionage that's... this has been discussed here? Sorry for interrupting, but I mean... It, surely this guy must be someone whose agents are operating outside East Germany. Well, it's both inside and outside East Germany and putting people on the payroll and doing what they did. And to realize, I think <coughs> one of the great lessons that we have to learn, one of the, Christopher talked about preserving documents, what we have to realize is how totalitarian governments work. And when we had the Vancouver summit with Boris Yeltsin, you have to remember that our children are not going to hopefully ever be acquainted with the kind of totalitarian governments we've seen in uh, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy and communist Russia. And those kind of things should be preserved in the historical memory of people. And this kind of story does just that. About 25 minutes left with our guests. Shalimar Florida is next. Oh, hello. I'd like to uh, clarify something with Mr. I I believe his name is Adelman. Edelman. Edelman, mm -hmm. about Head Start. Um, I tuned in just as he made the remark that the students who had the advantage of Head Start were indistinguishable from the other students by the third or fourth grade. Is that what he said? Yes. Well, that then speaks for the success of Head Start. The purpose of Head Start is to give disadvantaged children uh, the Head Start that they need so that they can... Uh, cope with the average by the third or fourth grade. Okay, now that's not what I said. What I said was among the disadvantaged kids. Hello? Yes, sir. Hold those, on a minute, please. Among the disadvantaged kids, those who went to Head Start and disadvantaged kids that had no advantage of Head Start, that by the, it's even actually the second or third grade, there was absolutely no distinction. So among the disadvantaged kids, you could not see that Head Start gave them a head start, except in kindergarten, first grade, and part of second grade. It, the advantage washed out. Now, let me say that the Head Start has also, since its founding, done things like medical, you know, with uh, cavities and make sure the inoculations and everything like that. If Head Start is going to be justified as a medical program, well, okay, let's, let's evaluate that. My point is, let's decide what a program is designed to do. Let's measure it. 
And if it doesn't do what it's designed to do, let's scrap it. Let's at least not triple its budget this year. Nassau Bahamas is next. Go ahead, caller. Hi, how are you? Fine, Congratulations sir. to C-SPAN, and uh, this is the first time I've been able to get through, and you have a great program. Um, my question is actually for both of the, uh, the journalists there. Uh, gentlemen, it seems that, of course, there's been human rights in El Salvador, and we should all be concerned with it, especially if someone's running for U.S. Senate based on their background there. Uh, however, I would like to point out uh, something that is routinely ignored by the press, which is the human rights abuses, 6,000 political prisoners, and about 1,250,000 people in exile, which is about 20% of the pre-1965 population of the Republic of Cuba. And this is routinely ignored by the press, and as a matter of fact, up until recently, <coughs> uh, interviews by the uh, members of the press of Fidel Castro, as Diane Sawyer's interview in primetime recently, uh, I mean, if you want to talk about throwing someone uh, softballs, or uh, what they call the um, slow pitches or whatever, e e easy, uh, easy questions. I mean, that was a, that was a case in point. Uh, from the time of Herbert L. Matthews in the early 60s up until recently, Tim Golden's articles on Cuba in the New York Times, uh, Castro has either been apologized or defended, or when he's actually, when uh, his brutal repressive methods are actually shown in an article, as, was, as they were in Mr. Golden's last article, they're taken from the first page, as his first two articles were, and then put somewhere behind, uh, you know, Metro News about the latest mugging on the subway in the city of New York. This seems to be a pattern. All right, sir, thanks. Let's get a response. We'll start with Christopher Hitchens. Well, it's not my impression that um, the shortcomings of the Castro regime in Cuba are downplayed in the United States. It just isn't my impression. I, I may have um, a warped view of this, but it seems to me that there's no Cuban embassy in Washington, that the uh, United States has been subjecting Cuba to an embargo and a blockade for quite a long time, that this is well known and uh, justified in Congress, uh, that several attempts were made by the U.S. government to physically eliminate, why, why do I use these euphemisms, to murder uh, Mr. Castro, often using elements of organized crime based in the United States, and that, in general, if there is a pariah state in American public and political opinion, it is indeed Cuba. So um, I, don't, I don't know where you get the idea that there's some special dispensation uh, given to the country. <coughs> I don't defend the Castro regime, but I feel, uh, sorry, <coughs> do excuse me. I do feel obliged to say a word in defense of Herbert Matthews, who was a very brave and good reporter for the New York Times in the uh, early days of the Cuban Revolution and did bring the, the news, which was not welcome at the time, but was, I believe, at the time true that the uh, Castro insurgency in the Sierra Maestra enjoyed wide public support against the Batista dictatorship. I think it was justifiable for Matthews to do it. And um, I say this as someone who's been fairly recent in Cuba and doesn't believe that the Castro regime any longer does enjoy the support of the Cuban people. Mr. Edelman, at the, the closing press conference yesterday, a reporter asked Boris Yeltsin about the level of Russian um, support in Cuba and the level of Russian troops still based there. Do you have any knowledge of that? Um, I do know that there are some Russian troops in Cuba, but they're being withdrawn and uh, have been ordered to do so by Gorbachev. I was fortunate to spend some time in early December with Fidel Castro, about an hour and a half. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's like being with a dinosaur. It's like being with a relic. It's like a living museum. Here's somebody who still believes in Marxism, still believes in uh, complete ideology, complete control of the country. The uh, few days before we were there, a few of the dissidents had been, uh, their apartment had been broken into, they had been roughed up, they, supplies had been demolished, and then they had been tossed in jail. It's a very repressive regime. In fact, uh, Castro and Cuba have twice as many political prisoners as all the rest of Latin America combined. And this is a regime that is a failed totalitarian Marxist regime. Having said that, Fidel Castro still is a very engaging person. Um, he still speaks, and I asked him if he still believes in Marxism. He says, absolutely. He said the adherence to Jesus Christ uh, multiplied manyfold after Christ's death, making the analogy that that will happen to uh, him after his death, and that uh, he really thinks on the Cuban Missile Crisis that we discussed for over a half hour, 
that uh, basically Khrushchev wimped out and that he, Castro, was wanted a stronger response and uh, Ka uh, Khrushchev was Mr. Nice Guy. So here is somebody who really is not repentant for anything he has done. He has led the country for 35 years. To think that he's going to change his leadership after 35 years is ridiculous. And uh, I think that the place is going down, down, down. It's going to be an interesting question, and I think it'll happen on Bill Clinton's watch, um, what happens after Castro. And I think that there's absolutely no chance to have a Marxist government there. There may be a chance to have a military government there. But if the democracy is going to come, uh, is it going to come from the Miami Cubans or is it going to come to, from the homegrown Cubans? But I do think that there has been too much emphasis on Castro, the personality, which is very delightful, as I saw up close and personal, and not on his repressive system and his uh, disastrous economic plans. Can I just um, add, since we're talking about foreign bases and troops in Cuba, that there's always been one very large foreign base on, on the island, namely the United States base at Guantanamo, which is now being used to... Uh, warehouse and imprison the people who are trying to get uh, out of Haiti, uh, um, which is another major problem on President Clinton's watch and another campaign promise that he's broken. A friend of mine the other day suggested that um, a possible solution would be for Fidel Castro to make every Haitian an honorary citizen of Cuba, because if these people who were coming on leaky rafts at the risk of their lives to the United States and being turned back and left to drown in the surf could claim they were Cuban, they would of course be allowed into the country. If you're a Cuban refugee, you are. If you're a Haitian refugee, you aren't. So I think we could afford to be slightly self-critical in our comparisons of Cuban, American, and Haitian human rights standards. Virginia Beach, Virginia. And thank you very much for C-SPAN. Uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Hitchens a couple of questions. Number one is, can you draw any parallels between what's happening in our country now and what happened in Russia during the uh, Russian Revolution circa 1914, the fact that there is such a diversity between the haves and the have-nots and that there was the marriage mm -hmm. between uh, the monarchy and the, the church and state, uh, you're smiling, I think you understand what I'm talking about, and how is it that we can see the dangers in the radical right in other countries, and yet we can't see the dangers within our own countries. And thank you again for C-SPAN. Well, um, I think the, the the only comparison that would hold at all, because I, generally speaking, look, Tsarism was, as you point out, an autocracy with a, a state church and uh, not even a vestigial parliament after 1905. Um, there was also locked in a, in a stupid and wasteful war with them um, with Germany. So, I mean, none of these things apply to the um, United States. Um, the only good comparison I've ever seen between Tsarist Russia and the United States takes place in the matter of comparing serfdom to slavery. A uh, very brilliant essay by C. Van Woodward on what's similar in those comparative case studies. But there's a 19th century studies. You might be interested to know, by the way, that the, the Russian serf owners considered the serfs to be of a different race. They, they didn't think they were uh, humanly equal uh, to the rest of us, and indeed uh, held to the superstition that if um, you examined a serf's body after he was dead, you'd find his bones were black. Um, so not unlike, in fact, the self-justifying uh, race theories um, that under underpinned slaveholding. Um, all other comparisons, I think, would not hold. Uh, I, it does obviously depress me that there should be um, such apparently widespread acceptance of the of the permanence of an underclass and that that underclass should generally speaking be of a of a darker skin color than that of the majority and i, I think that is appalling um but it it wouldn't license the comparison with uh, with sarism all the same we have about 15 minutes left in our program newport beach california is next yes i'm calling to ask your panel this uh the story that broke last week in washington uh, posts about the United States government using the U.S. Army to spy on, on African Americans. And also the story that broke probably about eight months to a year ago in the London Times about the United States, France, and Great Britain uh, was administering polio vaccines in the part of Africa that infested with AIDS. Can you respond on those stories? Thank you. You know anything about them? I lived in Africa from 1972 to 75. I collect African art. I love African culture, African art. And um, I don't know of those stories firsthand. 
No, I'm, I'm very much afraid of justifying what the caller must fear is a cover-up by saying that I don't know about either of these things. Um, neither the espionage nor the vaccine. I'm sorry to say. Let me um, ask on a related topic. Many of the newspapers over the weekend had comments and commentary, rather, on the 25th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, either of you have thoughts on that and where our society stands today with regards to race relations and civil rights well, issues? It seems to me um, that when you look, especially at college campuses, you get away from King's tremendous and very healing uh, and very forward-looking emphasis on integration more towards the black insisted segregation once more and this is black dorms this is black studies programs that shouldn't have whites this is black cultural centers this is um, all kinds of uh, institutions on campuses state supported for blacks that uh, whites are really not supposed to go to. Now, you think to yourself, if you believe in King's message of integration, which I do, and uh, just raci racial equality, and getting away from emphasis on skin color, then you think to yourself, would this be allowed if the b name black was changed to white? Would it be a white dormitory allowed at these universities, a white cultural center, uh, and the answer would be no, it would be outrageous. I mean, not anybody <coughs> in the world would ever no, I didn't entertain that. something like that. And so I, I'm very disturbed at the growing segregation insisted by black on campuses in particular. I was agreeing with you up until uh, that uh, equivalence, um, mm -hmm. because it seems to me that what, some of what you say may hold for campuses, but I mean, the fact, what, what, what is what's called... Um, ex-urban flight, flight to the suburbs, uh, but people deciding to uh, have a whites-only existence and more or less to call it that. I mean, in fact, in many of these um, new suburban towns in places like Simi Valley, California, and so forth, um, people have to more or less sign a paper saying that they'll keep it all white. Um, in other words, the phenomenon of whites saying whites-only is not a new one, and the areas which are blacks-only are not chosen by blacks as the places where they live. Uh, that, that the moral equivalence of these elements of segregation doesn't seem to me to be to hold at all, which is why the message of King is still so relevant. What, what I would agree, but more with, with Ken Edelman, is that I think the the recent Malcolm X fad has given a lot of people the impression that Malcolm X, proud, black, unbreakable militant, and Martin Luther King, rather weak, conciliatory, lovey-dovey type. It's not the way I remember it at all. It seems to me that. Um, Dr. King, by taking on a whole number of important issues of power and justice uh, and daring, even while he was in a life and death struggle, and really was life and death struggle over segregation, daring to say that the society couldn't both do justice to its citizens and fight an unjust war in Asia, and to take the heat that came from making that connection, and to, and to take the physical risk that was required uh, from, as we now know, um, the, the official political police of the country. Um, is an exemplary uh, record of courage and, and one that um, doesn't, uh, doesn't make it seem fair to me at all to think of it as a sort of milk toast moderate. Next up is Manassas, Virginia. Yes, hello. Good morning. Um, they've been talking uh, at length about the Iran-Contra um, investigations from the 80s. Uh, and <coughs> uh, people were upset with uh, various individuals for lying to Congress, which I agree with. I think that if you can't trust a person's word, then what can you trust? However, it seems odd to me that when we should be slamming some of these uh, people involved in Iran-Contra for lying to Congress, and yet um, I consider our president's lying to the entire American people about his not raising taxes on the middle class. Um, I heard the figure 200,000 before the election, and now the figure has gone down to 20,000. I'm just furious that Clinton has gotten away with lying to the vast majority of the American people, and yet nobody seems to be uh, making a big deal about that. I, I would like uh, both of their comments on that. And one final thing um, regarding the religious right and their uh, supposedly trying to, uh, we've heard that they want to set up a theocracy in our country. Well, I'm a, I'm a member of the religious right, and I don't want to do anything of the same, of, of the um, I don't want to do that at all. 
I think we should have freedom of religion here completely. But when a child is not allowed to even mention the name of Christ in the classroom uh, without being sent to the principal's office, I don't think that's religious freedom at all. And I think that the, relig the, the religious right has seemed to be the only uh, group in America that, that can be um, castigated uh, and made jokes of. For example, the Washington Post calling us poor, uneducated, and easy to command. Um, and a recent cartoon by Pat Oliphant, which characterized Christians as rats dragging an elephant into a fundamentalist mission. Well, if any of you saw the movie The Swing Kids, um, I saw a very similar propaganda movie put out by the Nazis showing the Jews as rats um, coming from the sewer. I don't Caller, their comments. thanks very much. Appreciate it. I was just going to jump in, but uh, wrapped up, so we'll turn to Ken Adelman. It's amazing um, the power of religion still in the United States. It is not something that the cultural elites realize. It is not something the journalistic elites realize. But when you look at uh, the world, except for maybe Poland, Ireland, and India, um, and a few other countries, that the United States is the most religious country on earth. Uh, the amount of church going, the amount of morality people feel and talk about. I personally do not lament the decline of religion in America. I think religion is enormously strong, and especially compared to uh, West Ger West. European countries. Uh, various polls have been done on the belief in God. And, you know, among Americans, it's 80 percent, 90 percent. Among Germans or French or British, it's under 50 percent. The general uh, church going, the general idea of uh, serving mankind, the general idea of the uh, sanctity of the Bible, and, you know, those kind of things. Any kind of measure that is done shows America amazingly moral. Now, when the caller in says, yes, but uh, I want the mention of Christ in the schools, I'm not for that. I'm Jewish myself, and so I don't want the mention of Christ in school, uh, except for historical studies and comparative religion and studying like that. I think that's absolutely fine. But I do think that there should be a separation of church and state. Um, and um, I can see that the religious right or any religious organization has an enormous amount to say in the United States because Americans care so deeply about religion. And I think that's good. I think it's very good. Um, to the first half of the lady's question, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at the way that Clinton's got away with this tax business. I mean, I, I burst out laughing the other day when he came on and said, um, I don't know what all this stuff is about the middle class tax cut in the whole election campaign. He said, I never heard anyone mention it. And I thought, well, neither did I, except for Clinton who kept mentioning it. He was the only person in the campaign who kept on about it. Indeed, it was the subject he used to change the subject away from Jennifer Flowers. I remember it distinctly. Another, another episode where I believe he was economical with the truth. Um, so to her first point, I, I concur. Um, and I think it's a very bad, it gives me a very bad premonition for the future of the presidency. Um, it might surprise you to, to hear, I mean, I'm, I'm an atheist. Uh, that, I, that it distresses me that I'm going to have to teach the Bible to my son and my daughter because the schools aren't going to teach the um, Bible even as a literary matter. They're not going to teach it even as a book. There's such a failure of nerve and it's such a failure of... Uh, <coughs> I'm, I mean to say not a failure, an unwillingness to offend anybody, which I think is, is a very boring way of educating children. The fact is if you haven't read the Bible and you don't understand it, from among, among other things, you won't be able to read Shakespeare or Milton or Dante later on. You won't, you won't get the allusions, you won't get the references. So <clears throat> it, it seems to me that while our education ought to be secular and church and state ought to be separated, and I believe churches also should pay taxes, that um, there is a, a danger of having a bland educational system that doesn't realize that religion is one of the great subjects of study. And I think that's a that's a compromise that one could make with people who are devout believers. We have just five minutes left. Lebanon, Indiana. <coughs> First chance I've had to call C-SPAN, and uh, I'm an avid watcher. Uh, I have a question uh, kind of for both Mr. Hitchens and uh, Adam. I'm going to ask him to trade places for a minute. Uh, for you, Mr. Hitchens, uh, I'm going to make you Norman Schwarzkopf and take you back when we had problems with Saddam. Uh, would you, in the previous uh, administration, would you have went ahead and finished this gentleman off, or would you have waited? And for you, Mr. Adelman, 
uh, if put in a, in a position, which I do read your column every day. I think you're an excellent columnist. I would not miss your column for the world. There, where are you? <laughs> uh, That's great. If given the situation uh, of allotting these billions of dollars to Russia, if you could allot them to the United States, what would you do with that? How would you help us out as, as the unemployed, homeless, and hungry that we have in our own situation without going to foreign countries and places that uh, pretty much, if given a chance, could take care of themselves? Thank you very much. General Schwarzkopf, you're first. Well, I'm, I know that I'm going to look as if I'm dodging the question, but I will really, really try hard not to do so. Once the invasion of Kuwait has taken place, um, and once um, Saddam Hussein has refused all offers to get himself out of there, um, then it seems to me that the military logic takes over. But it's been my whole purpose in writing about that war to show that that's not where it started, that in other words, um, if you, if you wanted to make a stand against Saddam Hussein, the time to do it would have been in 87 when he began his campaign of uh, genocide in Kurdistan. And those of us who did try and raise that subject at the time found that, um, to the contrary, Iraq was flavor of the month in Washington. Saddam was our great ally against Iran, and the, the build-up that led to the invasion of Kuwait began then. These are, these are things that a Schwarzkopf can do nothing about. In other words, by the time you've got to that stage, you're basically having a war between former business partners, and that means they're not going to finish each other off, because they may need each other again. So, I hope this doesn't sound evasive, but in, in a way I can't share the grammar of your, of your question. Let me say, in terms of uh, spending money in the United States, I do believe that uh, our infrastructure needs revitalization, the roads, harbors, etc. Number two, I would like to see some support for local poverty programs that really do work. In other words, if there's a successful program, and it's been shown to be successful on criteria established before it was started in uh, Columbus, Ohio, or in Asheville, uh, or any, anywhere, I would think that that would be a good thing. In other words, reward success in pro poverty programs. Third thing I would spend mm. money on is uh, teaching basic values. I think that school choice is an important institutional change. People have to have the ability to choose their individual schools for themselves and, or their children on the basis of uh, what performs the best. And secondly, just general values. I think a lot of the poverty in the United States is due to uh, unwanted pregnancies. Uh, I think it's due when you, to uh, drug use. It's due to um, just promiscuity in all kinds of areas, and I'm not just talking about sex. And if you would tackle these behavioral things, you would see enormous changes in our society. For example, in, in health care. We're going to have a month in, you know, of tremendous health care. When you think of what values do to health care, because of smoking, because of drinking, because of uh, gunshots and wounds, and uh, because of uh, drug use and all that, you realize that there's enormous damage to the health of Americans because of the improper values. We have uh, 30 seconds I'm going to give to each of you, and we've talked about the number of issues facing the administration. If you had an opportunity, Mr. Hitchens, to prioritize uh, where the administration should put its efforts, what's most important, how would you do that? In the 30 seconds, I'm, I was just going to repeat myself and say I, I, I personally can't bear, and I hope I'm not the only person, I cannot bear watching the, um, the destruction, the physical destruction of the Bosnians. That would be first on your list. And I can't bear to see the decline of values in the United States, and I think that uh, if I had to retailer the uh, Clinton administration, I would say stop talking about more government programs and talking about more... Uh, values and more uh, individual responsibility that we have to have and then you can match that with government programs I'm not one of those who thinks that the government has no uh, business in the domestic uh, poverty sphere or the domestic uh, sphere at all but it has to follow the right values Kenneth Edelman's column is syndicated by Tribune Media and you can read Christopher Hitchens in The Nation and in Monthly in Vanity Fair Thanks to both of you for being with us this morning. Appreciate it. And thanks for watching and for your questions from around the country. Enjoy your week.
This programming note, in just about a half an hour from now, C-SPAN will bring you live coverage of today's hearing of the Defense Base Closure and Realignment Commission. The hearing will focus on how the latest suggested base closings could affect strategic defense and the impact of the closings on military families. The hearing begins at 10 Eastern Time.